welcome to the World of Lord Russell podcast show. And today's show is aptly named A Beautiful Game, which is one in a series of books written up by today's guest, Tom Watt, also known as Lofty Holloway, of course, in the hit BBC soap opera EastEnders. Welcome to the show, Tom. Please Thank you very much indeed. Show. No, pleasure. Fantastic. Absolutely. Tom, we'll start from the beginning, really, because I think it's always the best place. Tom, you were born in Wanstead in East London, in the London borough of Redbridge, so a true East Ender. And uh, you studied drama at Manchester University, where you also directed several stage productions. This must have been hugely rewarding and a great start to your acting career. Yeah, absolutely. I should say, I, I mean, I was born in at once the General Hospital, but I did move when I was one. So I don't oh, know. Okay. I'm not exactly, it's not exactly kind of burnt into my memory. No, all my memories of growing up are to do with North London and Holloway and, you know, yes. Harry Road and where I actually grew up. Uh, yeah, yeah, all good. I mean, you know, I was very lucky. I, I was pretty clear about what I wanted to do from quite an early age. And so I ended up not going the sort of drama school route, but went to university and did a degree in drama at Manchester University and, and kind of kicked on from there, really. Yeah, um, started a, a small scale touring company and um, that, that was based in Manchester. And yeah, it was it was a really, really good time. It's a lovely uh, university, Manchester, isn't it? I know I took my son, uh, he got educated there with his degree. And of course, Manchester's a great town too. So lots going on, but your production. Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit different now. Do you know yes. what I mean? Like talking, we are talking quite a long time ago. So, you know, what, what this would have been kind of late 70s. So yes. late 70s, the light, late 70s Britain, I suppose, a very different place. So, but no, I, I, I'm spending a bit of time in Manchester at the moment. I'm a trustee at the National Football Museum. So I'm up there for, um, uh, you know, board meetings and stuff and, and um, uh, committee meetings and what have you. So, and I'm very conscious of, of how Manchester's changed. But I've got a niece who's who's at university at the moment studying history and is having a, a brilliant, brilliant time. It is a, it was a great place to to be at university, met some great people. And uh, you know, it was a, it was just a really good place to kind of start with um as I say we had a small scale touring theatre company that we yes. set up and that was probably uh, went for about four years, something like that. Uh and uh, that was a really good sort of way to start really doing everything you know writing directing acting booking venues uh making sets touring <laughs> emptying the van one man stop back show. The van, selling tickets all that it was it was really good fantastic that's that sounds uh, amazing and what were the, the main productions you were doing is it was a theme to it or was it just quite open-ended no production? not really but the only the only thing was that it was new work that was that was the thing really we did yes. Over the course of the four years, because um, it used to take us quite a long time to put shows together, they were scripted from improvisation and what have you. So, no, we did one about um, did one about uh, Frankenstein, one about um, Muzak, and uh, well, it wasn't about Muzak. It was about the way that um, music kind of works on us in subconscious ways. Yes, and it was one about um, a, an extreme Protestant sect called the Anabaptists who took over a town in Germany called Münster oh, in wow. the uh, what would it have been, fourteenth century, I guess. Um, so there, no, so you would definitely say there wasn't a theme other than the fact that they were all original works, well, rather and, than doing productions of other people's plays. Yeah, and written by yourself, I take it too, Tom. Uh, yeah, but scripted from improvisation. Yes, okay. So you know. They would kind of work with the actors um, and mm. uh, and come up with, you know, I had the idea for the stories, as it were. And, you know, we would kind of work around that, work out the plot, work out characters. And eventually I would sit. Yeah, eventually I would sit down and create a script from all that work. Um, and then we'd rehearse that script as you would any other play. Oh, that sounds fantastic. What a great, great bit of fun that must have been in your early days. And of course, um, one of your first television roles was in the comedy series Never the Twain in 1981. But your big break came in 1985 when you were cast as one of the original characters in BBC soap opera EastEnders when you portrayed the, the role of Lofty Holloway, the barman of the Queen Vic, you know, from the show's inception to, to, until 1988. Tom, this must have been an incredible time in your acting life as EastEnders was literally watched by millions of people each week. It's incredible. Yes. 
Yes, and obviously, um, you know, being in right at the start did make it. No, it was an amazing experience. It was a and quite unique experience, really. It was a, um, you know, um, it was a very new show. Um, yes. In the sense that the BBC were trying to kind of create something to compete with Coronation Street, but mm. at the same time they were trying to create something that was very different from Coronation Street, um, and. Uh, you know, to to kind of that it was so successful so quickly. It was, um, it? yeah. It was uh, it was an incredible opportunity, really. Yeah, so even I was hooked. I used to watch it every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, I often miss the Sunday matinee, but every Tuesday and Thursday, you know, it was EastEnders time, and the characters in those first early days were incredible. Um, you know, when you look at yeah. the Fowlers and. I mean, my favorite, one of my favorite characters, of course, was Nick Cotton. He was such a wrong one. It was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, fantastic script. No, you would, you, you, you know, you would have to say, and it's, it's true of, you know, obviously, I spend a lot more time writing now than I do um, acting, and, you know, you would have to say whatever you're talking about, whether it's theatre, whether it's film, whether it's television, you know, it comes back to the writing. It always comes back to the writing, yes. um, and that was obviously. Uh, Julia Smith and Tony Holland and a, a, a small group of writers had, had kind of put together, as it were, an idea for characters, an idea for environment, an idea for, you know, the neighbourhood and uh, the, the early storylines and stuff. And then, you know, and then there were some very, very good writers and mm. some very, very good actors, present what? company accepted. And what <laughs> And what happened was there was an amazing thing happened where... Because it was new, obviously, Julia and Tony had this idea. You know, I, I remember you all got given a, once you got cast, you got given a, a kind of a, a sheet of, well, several sheets of paper to say, okay, so this is the character's backstory. This is mm. the kind of person they are. This is their personality. This is, you know, this is their the people they get on with, that they don't get on with. It. You know, just all of that, a sort of character breakdown. But, of course, that's what you started with. But then obviously every all of the actors, every one of the actors, obviously brought their own sort of personality to bear on the thing. And what you never got was writers going, no, no, that isn't what we had in mind. What they did was they kind of watched and adapted and said, oh, OK, so they're doing it a bit like this and we'll, we'll change the character a little bit or we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll stress that storyline rather than that one because so it was this incredible... You, you weren't really kind of aware of it at, at the time, but in hindsight, you know, you were sort of, without ever actually sitting down and talking to the writers, mm. you were working with the writers in the early days in kind of creating characters that actually were kind of fully formed and three-dimensional and, you know, yeah. could go forward to have a life in the in the series. And I'm sure that, I'm sure some of that still goes on, to be perfectly honest, that, that exchange between actors, directors, and yes. particularly the writers, um, and and that made it a very very uh, yeah it was a, it was a very creative time it was great yeah it sounds in because actors I suppose now I listen to what you just said they are they were allowed to develop themselves weren't they so mature over the well, over the series I, I don't know about develop themselves but they were allowed to bring their own energy and their mm. own kind of feel for the thing and you know something that well, I don't know I, I, I've not got anything in particular in mind but you know you might get a scene written that was written as, as a comedy scene, yes. and yet the actors playing it might find something that wasn't comic at all, that was something <laughs> with an edge, yes. something a bit, you know what I mean? And, and rather than kind of get boxed in by that, mm. the writers and Julia and Tony and, and the directors as well would kind of respond to that. And, they were, you know, so you were, you were sort of creating something together rather than just just being the person that said the lines that were on the page well that's quite amazing isn't it it was yeah very successful it's still going strong today so a wonderful mm. series and of course in 2019 um you reprised your role as lofty holloway in east enders for one episode for the funeral of dr harold Legg. i mean what was it like to to, to once again grace out with square after all those years must be a yeah well i've done experience twice, actually you I've have done actually twice, three times oh wow so the first time was during the first time was during was during the European Championships. 
<laughs> and uh, I was working for BBC London at the time. Wow. And obviously, like everybody, um, people in Albert Square were watching the football. And in the pub, the football was on. Yes. And so they, rather than kind of, obviously, it was filmed in advance of the championship. So you couldn't have actual recordings of, you know, games or coverage of the mm. games. So um, uh, what they did was they, I went in probably about, I don't know, three months before the tournament started, four months before the tournament started, and kind of recorded some made-up football presentation and commentary yes. that could you never saw it but you heard it in the background on in the pub do you know what I mean yes. because BBC London used to get you know that was as it were the local radio station for for East London and still is so that was what got got used rather than Radio Essex that it was it was always BBC London so um so there was that and then I, I guess basically I'm now a kind of professional mourner so it, whenever someone dies who lofty knew <laughs> i go back into the funeral and yeah, it's, well, you... which is great to be fair because it one you kind of catch up with people like letitia dean like Gillian tailful like linda davidson who you know who you haven't seen for ages and yes. you just drop straight back into the sort of relationship you had 20 30 years ago that's amazing but it's also great because you meet current members of the cast people have you know i've I've never met or d don't know, yes. um, and uh, you know it's no, it's, it's it's fun to do. It's really fun to do. Well, it's good, really, because um, you, you know your character's still alive. It's not you've not been killed off in any way, like a lot of other characters in EastEnders have done. So you're still alive. So basically, to pull you back every now and again, so it's it's, it's pretty good, isn't it? Oh, so it's a great experience. It really is for you. I should I should imagine, Tom, fantastic experience. Yeah, because, yeah, absolutely. And of course, other other acting credits have included roles in in the BBC drama South of the Border, a London South London detective show, the role of Norman uh, in the nineteen ninety film for ITV, and the Nightingale Sung, a love story set during the, the war, Boone in nineteen ninety two, with a great actor Michael Elphick, as well as a minor role, of course, in the nineteen ninety two film Patriot Games, amongst others. A hugely successful acting career, Tom. Really, isn't it? When you, you look back. You've done some amazing um, things. Yeah, I wouldn't describe it as hugely successful. I'd describe it as kind of, it was, you know, I had a really very, very enjoyable career as a jobbing actor with yes. some great parts, great productions, you know, particularly great theatre shows. Mm. Um, so, yeah, no, absolutely. I was, I, was, I was very fortunate. And obviously, you know, having played a character in EastEnders for, for three years does, you know, it is kind of a, a bit of a foot in the door sort of thing you know it it's is really um it does it does work in fact to be perfectly honest everything i've done since you if you trace things back you go mm. well eastenders probably was a foot in the door there you know yeah. i mean you would like to think that you don't get to do other things unless you're half decent at them. but even so just to get to get the chance to do things yes um i think you know that time in eastenders was was life changing in that way, really? Yeah, no, I can imagine it was. Um, it's, you know, what was your favourite role? Would you think over time? And have you any have you any great unforgettable moments, moments that you remember and will always remember for the rest of your life? Is there anything in particular with the roles you've taken on? Yeah, but we're not here to talk all night. Are no, we? we're not. I, no, I've had some amazing uh, yes experience. I mean, played uh, Richard the Third in. Uh, Henry VI, Part Three, and Richard III. So the two plays that Richard yes. III is a character in played those in an outdoor production at a castle up in Staffordshire that was quite fantastic with you know mm. horses and cannons and flying falcons and I mean yeah, that was absolutely unbelievable. We had a great time doing a yeah I've, I've been really lucky you know I've had some a great time doing I've had couple of great experiences in Birmingham, funny. I did uh, a production of Christmas production of Scrooge. Oh, with, wow. Um, great Anthony Newley. Yes. Uh, that was just absolutely brilliant at the Alex. And then at Birmingham Rep, did a couple of shows there. I think in one in particular, a, a musical adaptation of the novel, um, The Ragged Travers Philanthropist, wow. which uh, we took on a tour around the UK and then took to America. I, I mean, in, in some ways you go, 
I did do a one man. Uh, it wasn't a one man show. It was a one man play. So it was a scripted play, but I was the only actor um, based on Nick Hornby's um, memoir, Fever Pitch. And that was, yeah, that was pretty fantastic, really. So yeah, no, I've been I'm very lucky, very lucky. And yes. I've, I've had some great, um, you know, I, uh, to be perfectly honest, I remember most of the acting jobs I did, mm. but don't remember. One, I don't remember any of the lines anymore, obviously. And also <laughs> don't kind of probably don't remember detail from them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because you do sort of do a job and then you move on and you sort of park all that and yes. um, kind of forget it, really. Um, if you run into people that you did those shows with, then things come back sort of thing. But I'm always just really focused on what I'm doing now um, why, rather than. Yeah, well, like clean your mind really to for your next role. You got to, otherwise, it gets yeah. quite confusing, doesn't it? I mean, after yeah. after leaving EastEnders, you began presenting sports segments on Channel Four, Radio One, Radio Three, Radio Five Live, Talk Sport, of course, and cable TV. So you definitely have a, a, a voice for radio too, as well, Tom, don't you? So many strings to your bow. Oh, well, I don't know. People who listen probably didn't think I did, but um, <laughs> I, I just. Um... Yeah, I just uh, really, it kind of started with writing about football. I did a book in 93 um, about the old North Bank at Arsenal. And uh, that really was what um, kind of got it all started, really. That book did really well. Uh, we'll talk about some of your end. books later on in this this, um, this uh, podcast. And because, because of that, um, and, you know, you're talking 93, so you're talking there, the birth yes. of the Premier League. Absolutely. Um, obviously. And so, you know, television coverage, radio coverage, newspaper coverage, all of those things were starting to to develop um, along with the new league. And, yes. um, you know, I just kind of got asked to do things that really it started. I went from doing um, the. Uh, the book to writing for newspapers was really the next kind of I did. Uh, match reports and features for the, mm. the Observer news, newspaper for, um, I guess, kind of three years, maybe four years. And then that, as it were, opened a lot of other doors. And yeah, and then got asked to go on shows as a guest and then eventually got asked to present shows. And so, mm. yeah, I was doing quite a lot of stuff for, um, for Radio 5. Um, the stuff for Radio 4 and Radio 1, well, and really it was Radio 4, Radio 2, those mm. more to do with either music or um, kind of reportage stuff. It wasn't really to do with football, but Radio 5, obviously. And then I did uh, start doing a lot of work for Talk Sport for four years, maybe five. Yeah, about four years. I did uh, presented seven shows a week for, for Talk wow. Sport and then moved over to, to BBC London. But that's kind of gone now, really. I mean, mm. I, you know, I love doing radio. Um, I love the medium. Yes. But... Eventually, you kind of go, you know, probably getting a little bit old for this, and you sort of listen <laughs> and you go, well, what people are doing now, if, it, if that's what people want, they probably don't need me for it. So I kind of just, I, I did talk sport for a long time, then I did BBC London for quite a long time, and then I did Arsenal had their own TV station, first of all, as a TV station, then as an online station, and I did that for several years as well. But then I just kind of went, you know, it's probably time to to move on so I've, I've kind of moved away from broadcasting yeah. now really i've done some radio shows myself as well bbc you know mainly sort of suffolk and norfolk and some independent radio shows but of course i can also remember um quite a bit of strange happenings that happened on, on radio shows over the years and one thing i remember in particular uh, was years ago when england played west indies at cricket and one of the radio commentators said, I forget his name, now, the batsman's holding the bowler's willy. Now, you know, that's hugely entertaining. And, of course, referring to Michael Holden in the West Indies uh, and uh, Peter Willey for England. But the, the commentator didn't know what he said at the time. Have you found yourself in one of those positions yourself, uh, Tom? We don't I haven't really, no. And strictly, strictly speaking, I mean, you are referring to one of the, the more famous outtakes in sport broadcasting and actually... Yes immediately he'd said the words he knew what he'd said and ah. that that particular clip is as funny as it is you know the line is funny but what's yes. really funny is Jonathan Agnew, Agnew completely losing it in the oh background. I remember that so uh you know that's the um so he, 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 he did know what he, he 
he didn't know what he, he said it. Yes. He just said it. And, but straight away realised what he said. I yes. can't remember who actually said that line. And it was Agnew was... Yeah, Agnew was just, was just rolling up, wasn't he? He was just all over the yeah. place. It was so, so, so funny. Uh, uh, <laughs> Macy Bow I always remember that one too. Uh, in addition uh, to your acting, film, radio and stage presence, you have also written, presented and produced several documentaries about football for BT Sports films, uh, including Football Outpost series. Uh, this must have been hugely rewarding as well, Tom. Are you, st- are you still involved with producing and presenting documentaries? Um, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, you know, I kind of, um, with that whole sort of area of, of documentaries, I mean, obviously, the, I did those, I did three um, films for BT Sport that, that were called Football Outpost, Football Outpost, Football Outpost yes. Europe, and then Football Outpost uh, when they were giants. And those three were kind of obvious in the sense that I was presenting to camera. Yes. Um, so, obviously, but I've worked on a lot of uh, sports documentaries, football documentaries, um, uh, and one or two kind of true crime documentaries where you kind of, I'm, I'm not sort of, uh, I don't think, oh, I've got to present or I've got to be the director or I've got to be this or you just, people come with it, you know, either people come with an idea or you have an idea. And, yes. You know, it's a collaborative process. And, so, you know, there are documentaries that have gone out on whatever, you know, BT Sport, The Zone, whatever. Yes. Where, you know, I might have researched and written them or I might have done the interviews or I might have sourced all the interviews or I might have gone in and sort of made sense of an edit that wasn't going very well. Or, you know what I mean? So. I, it, there are different kind of roles in on on different projects, and yeah, I am involved with a couple of them, well, that's a couple nice of three hear. at the moment, which are in various stages of of happening, as it were. And uh, it, on each of them, the role will be slightly different. Yes, absolutely. And because we know you're a great Arsenal supporter, you love football, and you've mentioned already that you did the Arsenal TV's Monday Night Fans Forum until it finished, which is great. And as an Arsenal fan, that must have been amazing to be able to do that. It really must. And of course. Uh, continue with the football theme and writing continued, of course. In and in May 2010, you published uh, what I, I view as an extraordinary book, The Beautiful Game, which is the name of this this podcast, all about the world's greatest players and how soccer changed their lives. You know, where you consulted with some of the world's top players, I think around 40, I understand, and uh, growing up and falling in love with the game. But boy, we, we talk about that, Tom. Please let me just name a few of these players as it's, as it's an impressive list. You've got Argentina's Lionel Messi, Brazil's Gilberto Silva, England's David James and Scotland's Craig Gordon, Italy's Fabio Cannavaro, Spain's Ica Casillas, France's Frank Rivery, and of course, and arguably the world's most famous player, David Beckham. And that's just a, to name a few. That's That's some book, Tom, isn't it? It was some book. I thought it was quite a good idea. Yeah, a beautiful yeah. game. Um, the world's greatest players. And uh, uh, oh. it, it was, um, so I had the idea. Um, and, uh, you know, we all know about players um, yes. that we see on TV. We all know this, they're kind of the, the clubs they play for, their international careers. We know about the career. I thought, you know, to grow up playing football in Argentina as opposed to growing up playing football in Zimbabwe as opposed to growing up playing football in South Korea. Mm. I I just had this feeling for... um, It actually came out, funny enough, it actually came out of a conversation with a really, really good friend um, who uh, for many years, over 30 years, was the head of the community department at Arsenal, a guy called Alan Sefton. Um, It came out, we we just were having dinner one night and. Just I don't know quite. I was producing um, some kids. Uh, they weren't really kids' books. They were they were educational resources uh, yes. for use in schools. Just using football as a way to um, just to kind of help young people engage with literacy, with maths, with you know. We just kind of saying, well, look, kids are probably already engaged with football. Mm. So how can you use football as a way to engage? And it was just, it came out of that. And I thought, that's a 
you know, that's a what 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 was it like for those all those great great players? Yes. What was it like before professional football became a? What I was interested in was, you know, where where they came from, their families, their friends. Where did they play football? Who did they play football with? What did football mean in in the country, the culture that they grew up in? And I just, you know, I just had a feeling that that was a um, that there was something I was fascinated by because it seemed to me that. Everybody knows, you know, all of those players, you know, the world famous players. Everybody uh-huh. knows Lionel Messi from Barcelona onwards. Yes. What about Lionel Messi before he got to Barcelona? Absolutely. What about Lionel Messi when he was six years old? You mean what? What? How? And in what circumstances did he fall in love with football? And that really was the kind of the idea for the book. It was done with a um, uh, a, a publisher. Um, who are actually based in New Zealand, mm. who are very good on um, illustrated books because it was kind of large format, a lot of photography. Um, but they were very good on kind of matching images with words. So I produced the words. I just go and meet all those guys, go, you know, go and do the interviews, talk to them about their childhoods and about football in their childhoods, but then stop the sort story as soon as they got involved with organised football. As Absolutely. soon as they got, that was the end of the story as it were, because Mm. I thought, well, once they got involved with organised football, everybody already knows the story. And um, it was kind of, uh, yeah, it was was kind of blessed project, really. It really was, because obviously, you you know, you go to football and you go to footballers, and and usually there are kind of two questions, which is, and they're obvious questions, I I don't mean this in any way to be disparaging, but the two questions usually, you say, oh, I'm doing a book. Would you be part of this book? And two questions are, one, how much? Mm-hmm. How much are you paying? And two, who else is doing it? So the how much didn't, I, I said, well, nothing actually, because what we're doing is we're doing this book and then a, a, a percentage of all the profits will go to um, uh, to uh, uh, UNICEF. Yes. So that was that kind of, and so people went, oh, fine, okay, I get that. Um, you know, a book about football and childhood that's benefiting, uni- you know, the UN's children's charity, mm. that works. People get that. And then, of course, once, so I'd done uh, a few years previously, I'd ghostwritten David Beckham's autobiography for him. Um, he had kids, but uh, his oldest was, I think maybe a year or two older than my my son. So we, you know, we I knew this would be something that appealed to him. So I explained the project and I didn't actually ask him to be one of the one of the players mm. because we'd already done the story of his childhood in his autobiography. Yes. But I did say, look, I think you get this. One, you get the idea for the book, which he absolutely did, but also as a UNICEF ambassador, you get what we're trying to raise some money yes and so he agreed to do the um the introduction and then you just start talking to players start with you know i started with people that i knew mm-hmm. or kind of knew someone who knew them and then it it sort of it just takes on a um you know once you can say yeah so david beckham's doing the introduction arsen Wenger's doing the forward kind of go people are sort of more disposed more predisposed to be involved uh, yes, but definitely. it was a, it was a, an amazing amazing project that all you know they were to a to a man it being 2010 they were all men yes obviously it would be a very different kind of project if you were doing it now but then <laughs> it was um all men. and and the other great thing about it was it was the book it was a book that was published worldwide um it was actually published first of all in south africa but then there was a you know there was a uk edition there was a an American edition, there was a French edition, Spanish edition, a, a Korean edition, Japanese Huge edition. Success. Do you know what I mean? So it, it did because it took in the whole of world football. And uh, that was a, yeah, that was a, a pretty unique, that was an amazing, amazing project to do, amazing yes, project imagine. to work through. Um, and of course, the idea. 
still works. So, so I remember, funny enough, off the back of that book, I then for three seasons, I did a, a weekly piece, a, a, a piece in the match programme for Arsenal every game, yes. which was <laughs> whole first team squad, staff at Arsenal, we had amazing stories to tell. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So it was, it, was a, it was just an idea that nobody else had had before. Um, and not perhaps obviously a commercial idea, but I like to think a really good idea and a quite, you know, a lot of those stories were very, very inspiring. Yes. Um, so yeah, that was that was a that was a great project. I loved that. Um, and funny enough, that led to the the book immediately after that. I think it was the book immediately after, or maybe the one. But because it launched in South Africa in yes. two thousand and nine, the year before the World Cup, I ended up going to South Africa to launch. Went to games at the Confederations Cup, mm. which happens every summer. Of, you know, as you know, before the World Cup, yes. went to games, and I was, I just completely fell in love with South Africa. That's a beautiful country. I just it? went. I just looked at it and I thought, this is this is a World Cup like no other. Mm. You know, this is South Africa's World Cup, but this is Africa's first World Cup. And um, what? Obviously, there were a million people going out there to to watch the games and write about the games, to broadcast about the games. What really interested me was about potentially the impact of the tournament on the country. And in the year between a beautiful game being published in South Africa and then it being published everywhere else around the world in 2010, mm. just before the World Cup. So in that year, I managed to kind of make contacts, get ideas and, and ended up doing... Um, uh, going to South Africa for about probably six or eight months off and on all through the tournament, but then after the tournament as well, um, just uh, talking to people all over the country about the impact of the tournament, not about the football. Yes. Uh, actually, the football in South Africa, that, that World Cup wasn't particularly memorable, but the event and yes. its significance was just enormous, like no other World Cup. That's arguably incredible. the most important politically sociologically mm. historically it was the you know arguably the most important world cup of all time so th to kind of capture that it was never published anywhere but south africa it was just for i, I did the project for the local organizing committee and it was a book that was distributed through football in south africa but also in the schools because my idea was the book was called um 2010 when the World Cup came to South Africa. Yes. And, uh, my idea was that there would be, you know, you, you think about the next generation of young people um, who perhaps wouldn't remember, actually were, were too young to remember the tournament, but would go, wow, we had a World Cup in South Africa. What was that like? And this book was the answer to that question. This is what it was like by the people involved. And, you yes. know, I'm talking everybody from Archbishop Desmond Tutu to woman who's setting up selling curry outside, uh, you know, um, the, the stadium in Soweto on, on World Cup final day to, you know, people running backpacking hostels to farmers up in the, up in the north and, you know, just all sorts of people and just trying to capture what the impact of that tournament on on a on a nation and on a people, and uh, yeah, that was and and a beautiful game very much led to that. Yes, um, you know, it was, kind of, uh, it was um, yeah, it was good. It was good. But of course, also you've mentioned already um, you were a ghostwriter author for David Beckham's autobiography. But of course, you've actually done two autobiographies for for David Beckham, both feet on the ground, um, which was published in November two thousand and four. Um, you know, where David David Beckham talks candidly about the, the perils of fame and also my side, where David Beckham's own in-depth account of his career to date for Manchester United, England, his child. Research, is, family, a great, research is a great thing. Mm. Research is a great thing, except when it's like they're the same book. It's the same so book. My side, my side mm. was the UK edition. Ah. Both feet on the ground was the US edition. Okay. They're the same book. Oh, amazing. But to have written that book as well and, and worked with David must have been an, a, an amazing achievement. Well, it wasn't an amazing achievement and a great, a great, a great time for you. Well, you know, David, amazing, well. It, was amazing. it was a great experience. Yes. You know, simply because it did have a, 
very very interesting story to tell and is a kind of you couldn't ask for someone better to work with in the you know the secret to his success if it is a secret i mean uh, i would hope people realize this by now is you know he's the kind of bloke who don't do things by halves if if he says that he's going to do something then he does it yes an incredibly kind of diligent hard working um uh respectful of other people um humble uh just you know very very good to work with yes um and so it was yeah it was it was that was a, a very um it was, it was a very positive experience all around it it just happened that when we started work on the book it, it happened that we wrote it together over the course of what turned out to be kind of sort of for him a life-changing season because we started the book um with the idea that what this would build towards you know it was his life story building towards him signing a contract at Manchester United yes. and have him playing at Old Trafford for the rest of his career and given what happened over the course of that season um 2002 2003 by the end of the season he'd signed for Real Madrid so it's, do you know what I mean it was yes. both it was a life story but it was also a, a, a story that kind of unfolded in real time um and to sort of be able to be around that while it was all happening um and obviously because I, I hope that well I know certainly in, in David's case I would hope generally people know that um I am someone who can you know who would respect the confidence yes um, of course you would and uh, so that there wasn't anything that was going on at the time which we didn't talk about at the time mm, uh, absolutely you know so uh, you know and there, there's some difficult stuff that david needed to talk about and um as well as the good stuff there was some mm. difficult stuff uh, and of course as i say there was this incredible story unfolding in real time um and uh that did make it a, a, a fairly remarkable year to be working together. To be honest. Absolutely. And of course, you would have become friends over that time. So David would have felt confident in yourself to unleash some the bad stuff on your shoulders, sharing sharing some of the bad things that was going on in his life. So that, that, that's that's good too, isn't it? Um, to, to develop that. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I, use, I, I wouldn't describe, I wouldn't describe the relationship as friends. Okay. I don't, I, don't, I don't think friends is necessarily a particularly kind of helpful. Um, you know, it was a, a really, really positive, uh, constructive, professional relationship. Mm. Which because is we're not there to be mates. We're there to yeah. do a job, which is to produce the best possible book that we can. Um, so I, I think that that was... I, you know, I wouldn't look whenever I see David. Look, we have that, that we did that together. Do you know yeah, what I mean? But I'm not part of his life. He's not part of mine. Do you know what I mean? We're not yes. like, we're not like mates. He's got his mates. I've got my mates. There's several years between us. We live in very different, you know, we occupy very different, we live in very different worlds. So I, I would, I would like to say that it was a, I would describe it as a professional relationship yeah. where kind of, you know, a, a degree of mutual respect um developed over the suggest the same thing doing the book together I, I think that's that's really what and obviously that respect mm. lasts it does yes yeah, a lifetime mm. so yeah um so that's really uh how i would describe it i wouldn't describe it as is it you know go try and professional doing a, doing a book is not about becoming friends it's about something yeah. else well, those people do, you know, um, my my ghostwriter, Ed Cousins Lake, he's written my autobiography. And, you know, we have become friends since. So it's, it, it can happen. It really can. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. But for me, it was, um, I'm just explaining yes. what it was. No, that's that's fair enough, Tom. Absolutely. The honesty is great, isn't it? Uh, and also, of course, you you um, recorded a version of Bob Dylan's subterranean homesick blues in 1985 with members of the British... Well, yeah, new band amongst other artists, but it peaked at, 20, at sixty-seven in the UK charts. That's another experience, isn't it? 
A lot of people would like to make a record. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you say it charted at 67, it was a miracle that it got to 67 because we produced that ourselves. They went back to my Manchester days, actually. It was a oh, wow. group of people. Um, there was a band from back in the day called Alberto y Los Trios Paranoia. It's an incredibly gifted uh, mm. singer-songwriter by the name of C.P. Lee, who's passed away, uh, God rest his soul. Some very talented musicians. We were just, you know... <laughs> We just thought this would be a good crack, wouldn't it? It wasn't <laughs> like, you know, it wasn't really, um, it was just a good crack. Yes. Um, but obviously when you're not kind of perhaps approaching it with exactly the um, serious intention and uh, more to the point, the serious budget that, you know, some kind of soap stars doing uh, records might have been backed by. Uh, we, You know, we took delivery of the first 500 uh, copies <laughs> i was going around doing radio and all of this and the the 500 first 500 copies of the single were all walked <laughs> so you, they'd go on the radio and they're like skipping and jumping and and to be honest it wasn't really the kind of thing that people ain't going oh is lofty from eastenders <laughs> doing an electro cover of subterranean homesick blues that yes. ain't really the 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 kind of traditional territory but we had brilliant time doing it i had a brilliant time doing it oh, I, uh, I have to say the um the video that went with it i'm still I see, you know I see, I see, it crops up now and again and i go <laughs> that's good that that's really good. you know we had yeah. people from new order in it and people from the fall and it was yeah it was really good really good so but that was just to be honest it was a bit of fun more than anything else yeah um, it sounds it and uh, yeah Huge fun, I can imagine. And uh, you obviously speak very, very well about it too, which is great. So, what? What? Uh, I'm conscious of time as, as well. And uh, what? Uh, what? What's? What are you up to these days, Tom? What have you got going now in the future? Have you got anything amazing uh, planned up? Yeah, it's all pretty good, to be honest. It's all pretty good. I mean, I'm in the midst of stuff, so obviously, I'm always get to the end of it and then talk about it. Yes, you know what I mean because you, you when you're in the middle of stuff, one, you don't even know sometimes it's going to happen at all, and two. Mm. The chances are when you're halfway through it, it's not what comes out by the time you finish it. So, um, but no, writing. Um, last my last book last year was actually with someone funny enough who was a, a has been a friend for uh, many, many years. All right, good. Um, Arsenal player, uh, Paul Davis, who's now mm. one of the half dozen top coach educators, coach developers in the country, working for the FA, taking new coaches and exit national players and stuff through their their licenses um and uh i did that book with paul last year i've just finished just delivered the first draft of another uh book for young people mm. um as they've got two or three documentaries that are in various stages of of happening you know some shot and we're editing some are still waiting to get commissions for so you know there's there's uh there's a lot going and watch a lot of football of love course. watching football um and uh yeah go to arsenal obviously but also i live out in gloucestershire now so i go and watch my local. i've got a season to get my local club Cheltenham town as well because i do quite like the old standing behind the goal watching league one yeah i've I'm been there myself a few times that. um you know we've got some so it's all all's good mate all's good. yeah that's brilliant and i think with, i was going to bring up Cheltenham town football club because i've been there myself and we have got um uh similar friends on, on linkedin at Cheltenham town football club and they do speak highly of you as well which is very nice to see um you're obviously a, a very good man a good character and, and that's great isn't it so uh, you do a lot for charity as well i think you were at bounce back weren't you a charity that trains ex-offenders i'm not sure if you're still involved with that but um yeah uh, well i have been involved I'm, I'm now that sort of that has kind of moved in a slightly different direction. I'm now mm. involved with an organization where which is kind of um the in the inspiration has come from the same woman woman by the name of Francesca Findlater. Yes. Um who I've known for many years who she started Bounce Back and now has kind of kind of handed Bounce Back on, if you know what I mean, to a okay. bigger organization. And she's now um running an extraordinary uh project actually called um um no going back which again is working with offenders okay. to try and reduce offending by training uh helping into employment also helping with other you know helping resettle after after yes. release and stuff in. but what's unique about it is that she is working with delivery companies of london 
delivery wow. companies in you know haberdasher stations all of mm. these you know um and can engages with them in different ways you know different livery companies can help in different ways some of them might help with a bit of funding others might help with employment opportunities other might others might help with a bit of training um you know others might help by uh staff going into prisons as volunteers yes to work with uh offenders before release so it's a, it's a really amazing project which you know like bounce back to be perfectly honest was something that nobody really was doing before and this certainly uh nobody's doing before i you know obviously i'm kind of not really involved at the um what would you say at the kind of sharp end if you know what i mean and i you know on a on a kind of daily basis or anything like that but it, it, it just helps an organization like yeah. no going back to know that they've got someone who can come and host an evening or you know yes. do that kind of thing which is which is all part of what they need to do so any way i can help i will um so yeah that's uh that's that's really good that i'm a, a just this last year taking on a, a role as a trustee at the national football museum up in oh, manchester which is uh, wonderful which is a little bit more time consuming than i thought it was going to be but it's great it's great because it's a brilliant brilliant museum yeah and you know it's at a really a very exciting time just been uh uh awarded mpo national portfolio organization status by the arts Tremendous. council which comes with money but also comes with the responsibility to move yeah. the organization yes. on and to explore different areas so it's very very exciting time to be involved with with the museum and it does help if you you know I, I, I sort of I, I think it's a fantastic, fantastic museum. Um, so obviously it helps if you're a fan of what you're. Of course, and if you're um, a football supporter like yourself and myself, yeah. and uh, so on, it's a fantastic uh, piece to have to your to your bow, isn't it? Really, that's wonderful. Yeah, football no, museum great. in Manchester, superb. There's so much more we could talk about, Tom. I know, I just know there's so much more. But podcasts have a have a lifetime, don't they? Really, of uh, uh, 40 minutes, probably we've gone over. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute privilege yeah. to have you on the show. Um, it's been a, a very interesting chat. And, um, you know, I, I, maybe we can do another podcast later on at some point because there's so much more to talk about. I'd love to have you back I'm on the sure. show. So, you know, let's keep in touch. We are friends on LinkedIn too. I know I've tried to get you involved with some football, charity football matches. You said you don't play anymore. Likewise, I'm the same. No, those days are but, gone, mate. Yeah. Those days are gone. <laughs> and, um, yeah, they're gone for me as well, really, to be fair. You know, I'm in my 60s now and uh, the knees, I've got to look after them. Yeah, they were well damaged from playing years ago. So, yeah, thanks very much, Tom. I absolutely enjoyed the conversation. Um, you're a lovely fellow, a remarkable man, a great career, and uh, I wish you all the best for the future. And just keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, I'm sure we'll speak soon. We will do indeed. Thanks, Tom. Have a great, great rest of the day. Speak soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Well, that was a lovely, lovely podcast with with Tom Tom Watt there. Um, and I'm um, hoping everyone's going to enjoy it. And, of course, the next episode on the World of Lord Russell podcast show is The Fall and Rise of the Phoenix, where my special guest will be Terry Owens, the former chairman and current life president of Aldershot Town Football Club, where we talk about the demise of the former Aldershot FC in 1992 and the birth of the, the Aldershot Town Football Club one, one, one month later, with Terry Owens, the chief architect, in bringing football back to the recreation ground, along with uh, the, the now late actor, of course, Arthur English. What a story this is. And I'm thrilled to be able to produce this show with Terry. So look forward to this one too. So for now, it's, uh, it's au revoir from him and au revoir from me.